right, if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 4 with me this morning. We'll be on the third sermon of, of a series that God gave me. It's called Standing for the Lord. We talked about in this series, we talked about, um, we talked about standing firm, we talked about standing positive, and today we're going to talk about standing content. So Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 10 with me this morning. And if you are able, will you stand for the reading of God's Word? Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to be abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again, for my necessities, that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abound to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, I have, having received from Aphroditus the things that sent from you a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading of His Word and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much, Lord, for this morning. We thank You, Lord, for Your grace and Your mercy and Your love that You have shown for us. Again, we thank You, Lord, for the veterans that are here and across our country. And uh, thank You so much for what they have done for us. But again, Lord, as uh, Cliff had said in the prayer, Lord, that You gave the ultimate sacrifice. And thank You so much for that. And I just pray to your God that right now, Lord, as I speak your word, that you would just give me the courage and the boldness to speak whatever you want me to say, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, all that you will do here for us today, Lord, and that everything we will do for you will glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Talking about standing content, well, leaning over a, a fence one day, an old devout Quaker he looked at his new neighbor. A new neighbor pulled in in a U-Haul and he backed it up. And he seen this guy, he was pulling out all the modern appliances. He was pulling out all the latest gadgets, the plush furniture and costly wall hangings. And he carried it in and the onlooker called over. The Quaker said, hey buddy, if you find you're lacking in, any, in anything, let me know and I'll show you how to live without it. Now I want you to think about that. Living without it is something that we don't have to have everything in our life. Being content means that whatever God has blessed us with, we're okay with. Whenever we know that God has given us something, we know that it is enough. And let me tell you something. There's a difference in being content of what you have and being content in who you are. Don't you ever be content in who you are. I'm just going to throw this little side note to you because I want you to know that in whatever you do and ever how you act and ever how close you are to God, you can be closer. Whatever you do good, you can do better. Whatever you do for the Lord, you can do a lot better. And so don't ever be content in the way that you live for the Lord. Make sure that every day you improve in that and that you get better at that every day. But the contentment that we're talking about today is the things that you have and the things that God gives you. And this is the question I want to ask you today. How do you stand content in the Lord? Now, contentment involves three things. Number one is being satisfied in God. He said in verse 10, he said, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. You see, Paul had expressed his gratitude to the Christians in Philippi, to the church in Philippi. He was saying that your kind expressions of love, your generous gifts that they sent you. You see, they weren't able to send Paul. It was 10 years ago that they had sent their last gift to Paul. Paul hadn't needed anything since. 
Matter of fact, for two years, they had kind of lost, or for two years, they lost touch with Paul. You see, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. And the last that they had heard, they had moved him over to Rome. So they didn't even know everything that was going on with Paul. But Paul knew, Paul knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that this church, now listen to what kind of church it was. This church was so good that they wanted to give to him so much, but they know that they, he knew that they lacked the opportunity. He knew it wasn't their fault. So Paul told them that I didn't send you a 911 call. You see, desperation says that I need somebody else. Contentment says I need God. Desperation says I need you to help me. I need this. I need. How many of you said that I've needed something in your life? In actuality, a lot of our needs are not actual needs. They are actual wants. Like if my cable goes out, that's an emergency, right? That's not an emergency. Is it? You see, sometimes those needs are not what God's talking about. When we have needs in our life, who's the first person that you call? If you're younger, you'll call mom and dad. If you're older, you may talk to your spouse. You may talk to uh, somebody else. You might go to the bank for help. You might go to all these places for help. But what we need to go to first is to God. You see, we'll never be content unless we go to God for all things. Do you get that? Whatever need you're in, Paul wants you to understand that we need to go to God no matter what. So contentment for us could mean this. It could mean that we're living off a certain income and you'd be satisfied with it. That no matter what, I've known that in twice in my life that God has cut me and my wife's pay in half and said, live on this, big boy. <laughs> and all I can say is, okay, God, let's do it. Because God knew exactly what we needed and He supplied every bit of our need. And so that we have to be content in knowing that God has given us exactly what He wants us to have. Living within your means to be another contentment. And I want you to think about this. If you get it from God, listen to this. If you get it from God, you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it much more. You will treasure it much more. You will be blessed in having it. When God gives it to you, He's saying that God says, I want you to have this. An amazing thing that when God says, I want you to have this. And when we take those things in our life and say, wow, God, thank you for this. Do you know that everything that God gives us is not necessarily a necessity? Sometimes God gives us things because he wants you to have it. You know what happens at Christmas time with parents? They want to do what to their children? They want to share with them with gifts because of why? Not because you need them, because of they want to give it to you. Sometimes our Heavenly Father just wants to give you something. He wants to bless you with things, and, and, and that's okay. And I'm not talking about the health and wealth gospel. Don't you ever uh, think that I'm going there with this. But I'm just trying to tell you that God gives us things. If you've got a nice car in your parking, in your garage, God gave it to you. And God gives you things that you can get back into the work. God gives you nice homes. God gives you vacation time. My favorite word in all the English language, vacation. God gives us these things so that we can enjoy. Don't feel guilty because you got them, but let God give them to you because when God gives them to you, he's gonna, it's going to be more blessed than you ever thought about doing. But let me tell you, let's change this up real quick. What if you take it and you decide that I'm not going to wait for God to give it to me, I'm going to give it to myself. I deserve it, I work hard. And guess what happens? When you start getting things that didn't come from God, guess what? You start forcing things into your life. And you know what happens when you start forcing things in your life? Guess what? You become in debt. How many of you know what in debt means? <laughs> we know what in debt means. We know what it means to live above over our heads. And then all of a sudden you're living from paycheck to paycheck. And guess what happens when you live from paycheck to paycheck? If you're married, I can tell you what happens. It's a thing called stress. It stresses out your marriage, don't it? Because you're wondering, how are we going to pay the bills? Or, or, hey, let's go out tonight. We're going to go out with what? <laughs> we have no money. You get what I'm saying? And stress is involved in this. And God says, if you try to force yourself to have all these things, you're not going to enjoy it. But if God gives them to you, he's going to reward you with certain things. Enjoy those things. But when you try to force things, guess what? You're going to be in trouble a lot in your life. 
and you're going to be in, in misery, and you're going to uh, obtain a lot of jealousy, you're going to obtain a lot of trouble in your life. So the type of the contentment is built upon circumstances. Let me tell you something. Does it mean that when you're content, does that mean that you're happy all the time, that you walk around with a smile because contentment means happiness? Contentment is not based on circumstances. You got it? Circumstances would allow you sometimes to not be content. But listen, when we talk about this contentment, it is Paul is referring to Christ. He's referring to Christ. Now listen to this. If God took away everything that you had right now, would you still praise God? Come on now, two people said that, but I want you to really understand that. If God took away everything that you've got right now, would you still praise Him? You know why I don't hear a lot of amens on that? Is because we're afraid to answer that. We don't know how we would answer that. How would we act if God took away everything that you've got and says, I want you to be content with the clothes on your back and that's it. Would we be content? You see, what we're doing now in our country is we're living way above our means. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And we're trying to have all these things that makes us for a luxurious life. And guess what happens? And because of this, we're playing out miserable. And God says, I want you to be content with me. Can you be content with what you got? If God gives you a nut, if God doesn't give you one more thing in your life, will you be happy? If God says, hey, my grace is sufficient for you. You remember that's what he told Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. What if God said, my grace is sufficient for you? That's all you need. Amen. What are you going to do? You see, now we've got to learn the mindset that Paul was serving a great and mighty God. He had met the Christ Jesus and it had changed his life for the best because Paul could have been anywhere. He could have had anything that he wanted. He had a lot of school and had a lot of knowledge. He could have been whoever he wanted to be. But Paul met Jesus Christ and it changed his life and his perspective on life. You see, when we change our perspective, when we meet Jesus Christ, it changes the way we think about what we have. You get me? Amen? Amen. It changes about what we need in our life. And then all of a sudden, we understand that we can live a little less than we thought we could. With a little less money than we thought we could. And then when that contentment comes, that's when you see that joy that comes only from living in a, a contentment that is in Christ. And the second thing... We talked about the first thing is that being satisfied in God. All right? So that's being satisfied in God. The second thing is this, having strength from God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I know that you have seen it time and time again. How many athletes have you seen wear this on their jerseys or put it on their eye black or they put it on their lockers and they say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many of y'all seen that? Amen. You've seen it, right? So it means that if this team over here, LSU, is playing Alabama, and all of a sudden, that's why the way he's wearing black. <laughs> when LSU is playing Alabama, let's just suppose that one guy on one team is saying that, hey, I can do all things that Christ will strengthen me. That means that I can win this ball game. And then a guy on Alabama says the same thing. I can do all things through Christ will strengthen me. So that's why somebody's got to lose that game. It doesn't mean that you're just going to have all these things, you know. It doesn't mean that Alabama's going to win every game. They're going to lose finally. Thank God. <laughs> All right, Dwayne, I'll, I'll leave up on <laughs> Paul uses the Greek word to mean this, to be strong or to have strength. He had the strength to deal with things. With Christ, he had to deal with all these things, including having the material things and lacking the material things. Whatever it was that Paul had, guess what? He could be content in it. This verse does not mean that I can do all things that Christ has strengthened me on your own power. It doesn't mean that you can have all these things if you ask for. It doesn't mean that you can jump like a grasshopper. It doesn't mean that you can move like a cow. It doesn't mean that you can do all these things just because you say I can do all things that Christ has strengthened me. Now put it in perspective. What Paul was talking about, he says, I have learned to be content in all circumstances. 
And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means that whatever contentment, whatever God's given you, you can be content in that. Now, that's scary now, ain't it? Because now there's a lot of people living above their means. And there's a lot of people that's in a lot of debt. And God's saying that you don't have to do this. You don't have to live this way anymore because you're strangling yourself. And God is saying that, and Paul is saying right here that, listen, it doesn't matter what circumstance I am in. Listen to what Paul says. No matter what circumstance I am in. Right? You know what Paul didn't have? Paul might have had clothes on his back. Paul might have had money from the Philippian church that they was giving him. But you know what Paul didn't have at the time? Paul didn't have his freedom. And Paul says, no matter where I'm at, what circumstance I am I'm in, God will strengthen me to get through whatever I am going through. So guess what? Sometimes you will go through cancer. Sometimes you will not be healed from cancer. Sometimes you will not win the ball game. Sometimes you won't get the car you wanted. Sometimes you won't get the job that you wanted. Sometimes you won't get the promotion that you wanted. But whatever God gives you, you can be contented. And you're saying, how can I be content when I know that I've got a disease that might kill me one day? It says this. Paul says, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't mean I'm going to get what I want like a little uh, pampered baby crying and, and screaming and, and stomping his feet until he gets what he wants. It just means that God is going to give you the strength that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how hard struggles are going on in your life, no matter how hard the disease is, no matter what's going on in your life, he says, I will give you strength to deal with that. Amen. You know what? Most people in the church don't want to hear that. They'd rather hear that God's going to, get, he's going to heal me from everything. He's going to give me the money that I need and everything. God doesn't always, God's not here for your comfort, by the way. Do you get that? You know why I say that? Because listen to what Jesus said. A guy come up to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. And Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You know what Jesus is basically saying? I'm homeless, dude. Do you want to follow me? I'm homeless. I'm walking from place to place. I have no place, no, no bed every night. I'm sleeping on this hard ground. And you telling me you want to follow me? So when you say that you want to follow God, know that it's not all about comfort. It's not about what you want and every desire that you have in your life. It's about how can I serve you, God? Now take that from the mentality that I want, I want, I want. I'm going to work until I get it. Then this is what I got to have. Now change the mentality to this. God, I'm content of what I got and guess what? I want to serve you, God. Give me what I need to serve you. And when you start doing that, the contentment changes in your life. And then all of a sudden, you're not content just to, uh, just to say that, hey, you know what? I've got to have, I've got to have, I've got to have. Does this hurt today? All my sermons hurt, don't they? I'm sorry. But that's true. God says that I want you to be content. Paul says that I'm content in these circumstances. I'm sitting here in prison. I'm telling you and writing you this letter, and I'm content about it. How? How do people that I talked about last Sunday, how do I go into those prisons for nine years, and I've seen guys that were content with what they had? No freedom whatsoever, but they were content, and they were happy. Because they know what it's like to be in Christ. They know what it's like to have everything that they want. You know what? Guess what? The problem is, guess what? We don't know and we don't realize that everything we could possibly need, everything that we could possibly want, everything that we could possibly desire is rolled up into one name. Christ. Amen. Christ Jesus. And once we learn that, it'll change your perspective. Guess what it's going to do tomorrow? It'll change the way you go to work tomorrow. It'll change the way you interact with people. It'll change to say that, hey, I don't need all this money. Cut out the overtime. If you can, cut it out. Spend more time with your family. That's more important. Is that okay to say? I don't care if it ain't. I'm still going to say it. Spend more time with your family. Enjoy what God has given you and be content in everything he says. I can do all things that Christ who strengthens me. Is this no matter what God... No matter what, God, no matter what I'm praying for, if you're praying for it, you're going to be in God's will to pray for it. And no matter what you give me, God, 
and we'll be okay with it. Can you do that? Can you say, whatever God, you hear this, listen to me now, I know some of you are praying for something so hard, and what happens if it doesn't come true? You see, the health and wealth gospel needs to be thrown out in trash because that's, that's a bunch of baloney. It's not about health and wealth. It's about how we serve our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we do that, it changes things a lot. Uh, J. Vernon Gee, he uses this uh, illustration. He says his favorite mode of travel is by train. And he says there's this train, the Santa Fe Railroad. And it's a train called the Super T. And it runs from L.A. to Chicago. And he says that Super T can say, I can do all things. I can, I can do all things a Super T is supposed to do on the track between Chicago and L.A. But let's suppose that he lets people walk in Arizona and he says, the, the train says, wow, you know, everybody always stops here in Arizona and they get to see the Grand Canyon. What if I just get off the tracks and I go see the Grand Canyon myself? What's going to happen when that train gets off the tracks? Is this going to be a catastrophe? Is it not? You see, as long as that train's on the tracks, it's going in the right direction and which way that God wants it to go. But as soon as you get off the tracks that God says, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be a derailment. It's going to be a train wreck. And this is what God's saying. If you will follow me, if you will trust in me, this is hard. Listen, look here, I'm not just talking to people that are just going to agree with me on this. You hate to be shaking yes, but your, your mind's telling you there's no way this is going to happen. I'm telling you right now to trust in God. To say that God, you have enough for me. You are enough for me. Is that going to be enough in your life? It's tough. It's tough. Giving sacrifice sacrificially to God is number three. Give it sacrificially to God. You see, the church of Philippi was a church who loved God and wanted to do things of God. They wanted to give to Paul because they knew that Paul was doing great things for the Lord. So they were willing to reach into their own pockets and give to Paul. They were a blessing. They were blessed because of their giving. Now Paul even told them he was, he was looking for a gift. He wasn't looking for their gift so much, but he was looking for the fruit that they would bear from it. Now listen to this real quick. What fruit would they bear? What fruit would the Philippian church bear from giving to Paul? Do you understand that Paul was in prison writing this letter back to the Philippian church? Do you know that this letter that was written from Paul from prison to the Philippian church is a letter that we still read today? Do you know that it's the book of Philippians that we're reading this out of? And do you know what? Not only is it a book that we are reading from, we are learning from it, and we're still getting gold nuggets from it to this day. That church is being fruitful even way back in the time. Do you see what's happening? Is that what happens with them is that they were blessed because they were doing it. And not only would they be blessed today, they would be blessed for eternity. Now, our church would be wise to follow the principles of the church of Philippi. We need to give. We need to give as a church. When the church says, hey, I'm going to support Los Brazos, guess what y'all did? Y'all didn't say no, did you? You stepped up and you gave and you're giving. You still continue to give to Los Brazos. Why? Because it's important to you. Because missions should be important to the church. Missions should be important to the church. Missions should be important to the church. Because the Great Commission is to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Missions is important to the church. So when the missions are given, when we are given to missions, when we give to ministries, when the church does ministries outside through this church, guess what? It's important. So guess what happens, though, when the church decides? That means that the leadership and the members of this church have to vote what this money is going to be used for. You get that, right? And in order to get that money as a church, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have to give as individuals. Guess what? I don't preach on uh, giving a whole lot, but you're going to hear it when it's time to hear it. When you give, it is a, an Old Testament principle to tithe, by the way. And some people say, well, that's the Old Testament stuff. We should be done away with that principle. Uh, the Old Testament principle says to give a, a tithe, which is 10% of your uh, earnings. 
Now, if I was to go around and look at you and ask you, do you give 10% of your earnings, I would guarantee you that not everybody here gives 10% of your earnings. Because if you give 10% of your earnings, guess what? We're going to pay off this life center a lot faster. And we're going to be doing more things than what we're doing right now. 10% is a tithe. And you say, well, that's an Old Testament principle. Well, let's go with the New Testament principle then. Let's throw out the Old Testament principle. If you don't want to go with a 10% tithe, let's go with the New Testament principle. Anybody know what Acts chapter 2, verse 42 of them did? You know what they said? They sold land and, and property as was needed. I guarantee they gave a lot more than 10%. You want to complain about a 10% tithe? Let's go to the New Testament. In other words, give. I want you to be a cheerful giver is what the Bible says. It's like this woman gave this uh, little girl. She gave her a dollar and she gave her a quarter. And she says, now I'm going to let you decide which one you're going to drop into the offering offer plate, that dollar or that quarter. So after church, the mother asked her, said, well, which one did you drop into the offering plate? She said, a quarter. And why did you drop a quarter into the offering place? She said, right before the offering was taken up, the pastor said to be a cheerful giver. And she knew that she couldn't be a cheerful giver. She gave it up. <laughs> if you have that kind of mentality, what happens? If you have the mentality that I am given to this church, listen to this. I'm going to explain this really quick. I'm not all about giving, but I'm going to tell you real quick what an offering does. Okay? The offering is what operates this church. If you like these padded pews you're in, then that's come from the offering. If you like that these lights are up and you can see right now, it's because of the offering. I know that some of you are fanning and waving. It's like, oh, dear God, it's hot in here. Uh, the heat's up maybe a little too high, but, but it's better than being out in the cold. Amen? All right, so when it gets down to 13 degrees, as it might get down to, you would be glad for a heated building, right? When it's in the summer and it gets really hot, wouldn't you be glad for air conditioning? Right? These things, it costs to operate the church. Right? It costs the uh, band, uh, for the bands to be operated, to keep them running, to keep gas in them, to do things that, listen, if we don't tithe to our church, guess what happens? The church doesn't operate to its full capacity. And you know what happens to the church a lot of times? In most churches, and, and this is the majority of churches across the world, is that only a few people are given their 10%. And they're probably even given a more and above that 10%. And that's what the church is operating on. Now, let me ask you this. You want a revival in this church? That's what y'all told me when I got here, right? You want a revival, right? Give me an amen. 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 All right, amen. It's going to start with you reaching into your pockets and giving. Because if you don't give... What happened to the amen on that one? <laughs> well, I don't got personal now. I got in your pocketbook. You don't like that. If you want a revival to start, you're going to have to give because God told you to give. If you want a revival to start, you've got to be faithful. You've got to be faithful and give your 10%. Now, what about everything else? What about above and beyond that as an offering? When you start uh, supporting other stuff and you start buying this and that, and you do buy stuff for Operation Christmas Child, that is an offering. You get it? Above and beyond your tithe is an offering. And what happens is when we start giving these things, we will be blessed. Do you know that you will be blessed as a person if you give your 10% tithe? My wife was not a Christian when I met her. <gasps> she became a Christian before we got married. And you know what? One of the things that she could not understand, and she'll admit to this today, is that when I told her we're giving 10% of our church tithe to the church, 10% of our earnings to the church, she didn't get that. She didn't get that at all. And we had to butt heads just a little bit about it, not much. But then, when we started giving, we started giving. And Michelle, tell me if I'm wrong, we have a mess down. Right. And you know what happens when we give this 10% from our tithes every Sunday without missing? You know what happens? We've never, we never needed anything. Amen. God has supplied it more than I ever dreamed about. You will not outgive God. Amen. So you know what the Philippian church was doing? They were given to an important mission. If your church is important, you give to your church because it's important to you. And you are important because it's, guess what, glorifying God and doing the missions of God. If that's important to you, you give to your church. Amen. 
And here you go. The Philippians were given to Paul and they were happy to do it and they wanted to give to him more. And they didn't even have the opportunity, but they kept giving. And Paul said, you're going to bear fruits from this. You're going to continue to give fruits from this. What would happen if our church continued to be faithful to God, give to God like we're supposed to, and guess what happens? Guess what happens? You know what contentment also does in the life of a believer? When you reach into your pocket and you give it to somebody else, it might hurt for a minute. But start doing it. I, mean, I don't care what it is. Buy somebody a drink this week. A uh, 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 soft drink. Okay. Don't, don't upload that. Huh? Make sure we get that straight. All right, so get something for somebody. Buy something for somebody. Hand somebody money that somebody needs. And make sure that it's for the right purpose. But let me tell you something. When you do that, you know what happens when you reach into your pocket? I've never known how this works. Now, it's going to seem like this is crazy. But when you reach into your pocket and give something and you think that you're going to be without it, God puts more into your pocket. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, only the few people that's done that and tried that understands that. I'm telling you right now, is there people in here that tried that? Give me a hearty amen. amen. And you know what happens is that you still get money and God's still giving it to you. You know what? Not for you to go spend it on yourself, though. To give it away again. And God said, I want you to be blessed. I want to give you this so that you can give it away. That don't sound like the American dream. <laughs> this is what God says though. When I give it to you, give it away. When I give it to you, give it away. You see, and then once we start giving sacrificially to God like that, we'll know that we're content in everything that we need. Contentment involves being satisfied in God, knowing that God has given you everything that you need. Contentment is having that strength from God, that in that contentment, whether you have or whether you don't have, God's going to give you the strength to withstand it. You get it? And the third one is this, giving sacrificially to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I need, I need contentment in my life. I need it because sometimes I want stuff. And it's okay to want to a certain extent. But let me tell you something. When God says, I've given it to you, be happy for it. Mm -hmm. When God says, I've given you all that you need, if I don't give you anything else, be happy for it. Isn't that great? You want to know the secret to contentment? It's not about having all this stuff. It's not telling, living the American dream, as people say, it's about being content in what God gives us. Thank you, God, for this shirt on my back. Thank you, Lord, for this suit that I've got on. Thank you, Lord, for the car that I'm driving. Thank you for my home. Thank you for, uh, thank you for my help. Thank you for, you see what I'm saying? You see the illustration that we had in the beginning? We always want something that we don't have. And God says, I give you what you need. You don't have to want what the other person's got. Because whereas you want something else, somebody else is wanting what you got. And they're desiring to have what you have. Think about it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you.